So how can we implement mutation without using uh, mutation? <laughs> right? So how can, or, or to rephrase it, how can we implement mutation by means of um, an immutable setting? Um, how do you encode that? Right, because you cannot; it, it doesn't exist as a as a first class primitive. Um, and uh, let's let's look back uh, at our previous lesson and re remember why uh, the problem exists. Um, so this is the simplest example where we define a function first, and notice that the function we're defining mentions a variable that is defined in the scope of. Um, in the outer scope, right? So it's it's visible at the same level of B, right? So A and B are both visible in the same place. Wherever A would be, B is also visible. Um, and the idea here is that this A only exists when you call it, right? So because when you call it here, A has already been defined, then this is fine. That is the semantics of racket, which might be surprising for some, but this is how it works. Um, you have to remember that uh, Racket is really kind of, the way I like to think of it, is really like the Python of, of functional programming languages. So it, it, it has to be dynamic in the sense that it should work uh, very easily. Um, and the fact that you may, you know, you don't have to define things in order is a good thing. Imagine you had uh, a mutually recursive function um, how would you encode such a such a functionality in your language unless you have a feature like this? It is possible, but it might not be immediately obvious, and you might need some other support from your language. So, but that is a digression. Uh, let us focus on how Racket does it. And the point that I want to make here is that when uh, this lambda is created, it is actually accessing. Um, it should refer to the environment that it creates, that it was created, right? But it shouldn't take a snapshot of it. And what that, by this I mean it shouldn't create a copy of it, um, because otherwise, uh, at this point, the environment is empty, right? So other, and therefore A doesn't exist, right? So the environment that you pass in the closure that is created by evaluating this lambda should refer to an object that will be mutated, right? At some point, we will add A to it. Uh, and, and when I call B, I should be able to read A from it. So how do we define this notion of a shared mutable state with immutable data structures? Um, first of all, let me take a step back and answer one question you might be wondering, which is, why do we even care about immutability? Um, and there are some constraints. I mean, some languages are constrained in that way by design, like Haskell, uh, where you don't have mutation at all. Racket does have mutation, and there are some constructs for it. Uh, usually they have a little uh, exclamation mark on the function name, if it's a mutable function. Uh, although we are not using it, and you're not allowed to use it in the homework. Uh, because the point of this course is really to make you think about, uh, you know, think outside of the box, think of new things, uh, new programming models that you're not so familiar with. And the idea of immutability is not something uh, as, wide uh, as widespread as it should be. So one reason why you would like uh, immutability is because it, it, it gives you a really uh, easy, simple way to achieve parallelism. And as you know, most computers, uh, your phones, um, almost every computer available is parallel, right? We are in the, in the age of everything is parallel. Um, so to, to take advantage out of these computers, you really need to be able to parallelize your algorithms. Um, and when you have a parallel algorithm, a key point of it is, you know, you have to divide it into multiple parts that are running independently one from another. But all of these subcomponents, usually known as threads or tasks or processes, need to communicate somehow, right? Uh, communication between processes is not trivial, and there are many ways to achieve that. You can do it by uh, with channels, uh, by message passing, um, or you can do it via shared memory, or you have, uh, it's also known as a blackboard 
uh, paradigm where you, uh, every thread accesses a shared pool or a shared resources and they m may change it. Uh, and mutation uh, represents communication. Um, however, as you probably are aware of, whenever you have this shared, a shared resource, uh, there is a source, there is a possibility of mistake, right? Where one part is not aware of some changes that the other part wants to do, which might be caused by an error, a programming error. So by making shared resources immutable, you eliminate this source of errors, which is a very good thing. It allows you to simplify the understanding of an algorithm, right? You don't have to think about what could happen behind my back if things don't change, right? If the things are fixed in place. And that is, so it, it really makes parallelism much simpler uh, if you can do it. Sometimes you can't, uh, but if you can do it, it's a very easy way to share data. And because it's immutable, you don't have to constrain access to it. You don't need locks. You don't need any kind of transition transactions or any um, synchronization mechanism to control or mediate the access to the data. It's readily available and everyone can read it. Um, and if you want to write on it, you can look, um, you should look up uh, copy and write or this idea where Everything is, is immutable by default. And if you want to change something, you create a new copy. And if you think about it, that's basically what we've been doing so far, right? When we have a data structure, if we want to set a field, what we do is we create a new data structure, a new value of that data structure. Um, so another benefit of it is development or maintenance of code, right? Because if your code is somehow documented as being immutable, that makes thinking about it much simpler. You know, if you you pass that value to a function, the value won't change in the function you passed. So when you, once you get it back, you you know nothing changed uh, by passing it to a function. It's the same idea that I talked about parallelism, but now uh, in a sequential in a sequential setting. Um, additionally, uh, memory management becomes much simpler, right? Um, essentially because you can't have um, circular references when you have immutability unless you kind of design it by default. But it, it kind of makes it much more complicated to write circular data structures, which are notably uh, difficult to manage in terms of memory. Uh, and we'll look into this a bit in more detail in a future lesson. Um, so yeah, in the end, I think immutability is a very good tool to have in your toolbox uh, as a software engineer. Um, and that's why I, I put so much emphasis in this module on it. Okay, so in the end, what we want to do, we just want to represent, we want to have a logical or a logic represent, a logical representation of shared memory. So what does shared memory have? Uh, well, I will initialize it, there's a constructor for heap, uh, for the empty heap, which is just empty memory. And then there's something to allocate memory, where you get a handle to it. And then there's something to update uh, the contents of that handle, which we call a uh, heap put. And you can think of a, a shared memory really as a hash table, right? Uh, if you think about a hash table, keys values, uh, and you can update the keys or the value, sorry. Um, you can think of that as being a memory, a uh, shared memory. Right? You can think of an array as a, as a hash table as well. Or to put it in more abstract terms so that you don't frown, um, as a map. Right, An array is a map where the keys are the indices and the values is whatever you're storing it. Uh, but the array also conveyed this idea of uh, how it's represented in the computer, right? where it's a contiguous, um, contiguous um, sequence of data. Um, so there are some performance benefits of that. However, if you think about it in abstract terms, um, shared memory is no more than a map where your keys are handles. So they're memory addresses, right? And the value is whatever you're storing there. So this is what we have. Um, and that, that's why we have the empty heap as the one of the constructors. The other constructor is allocating a value where you're gonna create a new 
you have to somehow create a new memory cell, store that value into it, uh, and return the pointer to that memory cell. And he put that given a memory cell location and a new content, it will update the contents of that memory cell with the value provided. Uh, and finally, we have one selector, which is get, right? So that you can read the contents of a memory cell. Okay, so now in the next um, video, what I'm going to give you is a short, short tutorial, live coding, of uh, heap usage. Okay, um, so I'm going to skip these slides. Um, and in the next video, I'm just going to uh, write that, do the, the live coding exercise.